Mr. Philip, perhaps. All right. Am I on? Yes. All right. Uh, let's see if I can not walk over any cables. Uh, all right. So uh, this presentation is entitled uh, FreeBSD is not a Linux distribution. And whatever you take away from this presentation, you should be soothed by the fact that it is not a Linux distribution. Am I feeding back? OK. Um, it is not a Linux distribution. So you can relax, calm. There is no anger. There is nothing, uh, nothing to be afraid of. It is not a Linux distribution. There is Everything is fine. Uh, and we've had a lot of Linux presentations presentations at this conference, I think there's a parallel track about it. And I'm just here to tell you that you, know, you don't have to live this way. Uh, it is, in fact, possible to uh, find a, a Unix operating system which does not make you angry, comes with all sorts of nice features, and uh, just does not present any surprises uh, along the way. Uh, so thank you, Todd, for the introduction. My, my name is uh, Philip Papps. I'm wearing many different hats. Uh, the hat I wear today is the uh, director of the FreeBSD Foundation uh, hat. Uh, we, uh, the FreeBSD Foundation supports the FreeBSD projects in many interesting ways, uh, from meals to hardware. Uh, we are a charity registered in Boulder, Colorado, in the US, and we take uh, money from companies and individuals uh, who use FreeBSD and feel that it needs to be improved. And we spend this money on sponsoring conferences uh, and uh, organizing BSD conferences and arranging travel for BSD developers to uh, conferences around the world. Uh, we also spend our funds on uh, hardware and improving support for FreeBSD uh, for different kinds of hardware and different kinds of platforms. Uh, so if you uh, actually use FreeBSD, is anyone in this room using FreeBSD in production or? Yes, good. The usual suspects. Anyone else? Ah, good. Very good. Uh, so at least a handful of you. Uh, if any of you happen to have too much money uh, lying around and you have fiscal incentives to get rid of it, the FreeBSD Foundation will be happy uh, to relieve you of this burden and use it to uh, improve FreeBSD. Uh, so that was the FreeBSD Foundation. So who? So you know that was the organization. Who am I? Uh, I'm a kernel hacker. I live in the mystical world below the system call layer. Uh, and I'm also a conference organizer, repeat offender. I, apparently, I cannot attend the conference without somehow ending up organizing it or doing something. I don't know how this happens, but it just happens. Uh, I'm also a consultant, so I'm in the business of uh, telling people that they're doing it wrong and getting paid for it. Uh, but my, uh, my, my domain where I, I live, I live mostly in device drivers. I live in real-time operating systems. Uh, I also have a troubled history with electronics, particularly radios, and I'm a professional paranoid. Uh, so as we go through this presentation, uh, you'll find the kernel hacker, the professional paranoid, and uh, you know the, the hardware, the simple hardware mind, creeping in from time to time. So bear that in mind. Uh, also, this presentation was originally written by uh, George Neville Neal, uh, another FreeBSD Foundation director, who has many similar uh, properties in his background, uh, you know, except for the uh, electronics bits. So on with the show. Uh, what is this FreeBSD thing? Uh, you know, is this Linux? Is this some you know? Is this some weird cult? Uh, we see this. Uh, you know, you, you type FreeBSD into a search engine and you see this little devil guy smirking at you. Uh, are we some weird satanic cult? Uh, no, we're not. Uh, we produce an operating system, uh, a complete operating system. Uh, unlike some uh, other open source operating systems, we feel. Uh, we take a more holistic view of what an operating system is. We don't just produce a kernel. We don't just produce uh, a bunch of tools. Uh, we don't just produce a bunch of libraries. We actually produce an entire operating system with all the build glue you need to uh, build it yourself and to build your own release of it. Uh, so if you're familiar with Linux, you might have heard the word distribution uh, once or twice, and it makes you cry. Uh, a Linux distribution is a collection of tools written by different groups of people with often conflicting interests and priorities, and somehow it works, maybe a little bit. Uh, FreeBSD is a complete operating system produced by a team of people who feel that they are producing an operating system. Uh, there are no conflicting interests in the FreeBSD project. So the people who maintain the kernel 
are also the people who maintain the C library, the people who maintain uh, LS uh, and stats, um, all that sort of goodness, which I understand lives above the system call layer. Um, we produce our operating system, and we also produce uh, the tools to uh, to build it and to maintain it. So if you check out FreeBSD, we'll come into that uh, in a moment, you get everything you need. You basically, uh, if you have FreeBSD, you are ready to code as soon as you install it. Uh, FreeBSD is a POSIX-like operating system, and uh, at last count, uh, we support 24,000 uh, third-party packages in our ports tree, or our package system. Uh, so any piece of software you're familiar with on other POSIX-like operating systems, and even Linux, will also just work on FreeBSD. So you, you know, package install Nginx, and you have Nginx, uh, just like you would expect it on uh, another operating system. Uh, and in addition to all this operating system tools and, and third-party glue, we also document everything. So I was smirking at some of the presentations earlier this morning. I think Manan in, in particular uh, was uh, looking up uh, what the uh, you know what, what is the CPU load average? What does that mean? And typed it into some search engine, and then went on to Stack Exchange and you know many many layers of uh, searching. Later, he found out that the answer was well, nobody really knows what the CPU uh, load average what, what that means. Uh, uh, the FreeBSD project feels that you should not have to go through this, uh, so we provide documentation so that if you want to know what is the CPU load average, you can do you know man minus k uh, uptime or some other tool that gives you the CPU load average, and it will tell you the CPU load average is the weighted average of all the processes in the run queue, and it is determined by etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have documentation that will hopefully make your life easier. And we are also an open source community. Uh, so the, the operating system does not stand by itself. Uh, it's a community of uh, like-minded individuals that produces the system, uh, and we hang out at conferences, and we, you know, we turn up in places. So I'll tell you a bit about the community uh, as well. So, uh, OK, who uses this FreeBSD thing? Well, five people in this room, or six people in this room. Great. I don't know if your names are on here. Uh, but at least, I hope some of these names uh, should be familiar to you. I think, uh, particularly, WhatsApp is uh, quite popular in India. It's, uh, I think it's a messaging application for phones. Uh, they run on FreeBSD uh, entirely. So all of their servers, all of their stuff uh, runs on FreeBSD. And they admit to running FreeBSD. Um, uh, another example of a company running FreeBSD very successfully is NetApp. Uh, if you have a lot of data, does anyone use NetApp? Probably not willing to admit to it. Uh, NetApp is a big company producing uh, storage systems for people with a lot of data who care about data. Uh, their ONTAP operating system is basically a fork of FreeBSD, and they, they just track FreeBSD. Uh, Panassas and Dell, uh, well, Dell EMC uh, have similar sort of use cases. They take the FreeBSD operating system, they make their own builds, and they call it whatever their operating system is. And, uh, but really, it's just FreeBSD. Uh, so a lot of these names are uh, in the uh, storage industry, so Panassas, Dell, um, and uh, oh, NetApp, wherever they are at the top. That's all storage, so that's one uh, area where FreeBSD is very popular. Uh, another area where FreeBSD is popular is networking, so Juniper Networks is the, uh, the usual example. Uh, Juniper makes routers and switches and other networking equipment, firewalls, and other stuff that lives there, and their Junos uh, operating system is basically a fork of FreeBSD. The control plane of your Juniper router is basically uh, a FreeBSD machine which talks to uh, the actual uh, forwarding engines. Uh, other examples, Yahoo, Yahoo Mail runs on FreeBSD. Um, it still does. Uh, it's remarkable that it works. Uh, and then Apple is another good example of someone using FreeBSD. Apple takes the FreeBSD user space and parts of the kernel, merges it with the mock VM system and mock forts and some other stuff, adds their own secret sauce, and they call it Mac OS X. Uh, I call Mac OS X, I call it pretty BSD. It's, it's Unix for the desktop. So, that, you know. That. Oh, and Netflix, of course. Thank you, Todd. Uh, another company in the networking industry, Netflix, I think, is responsible for about, what, 30 or more percent, more than half the internet bits flowing across the internet uh, on any given day. Uh, all of those bits flow across FreeBSD machines. Netflix's caches are basically FreeBSD machines tuned to deal with uh, this massive storage influx of moving pictures just pushed into uh, FreeBSD machines. So all of these are big companies. So FreeBSD is not this marginal you know, thing which doesn't really exist, and it's not been dying since 1998 or whenever Slashdot came up with that. Uh, FreeBSD is really real and is being used by uh, many companies. 
And you, know, you might be wondering, why are they using this? Well, you know, why are they using this? Uh, they are using it because FreeBSD has a history of innovation uh, and gradual innovation uh, over longer periods of time. So the FreeBSD project will think something up and we'll develop it, and then you know, five years or ten years later, we'll find it in other operating systems like you know the next. Um, we produce great tools. Uh, the FreeBSD is more than the sum of its parts, and there are many companies who just like the fact that they can take a part of FreeBSD and use it in their application. Uh, people in this room who shall remain nameless have shot parts of FreeBSD into space. Uh, people who shall remain nameless uh, have used FreeBSD, uh, parts of the FreeBSD operating system on uh, embedded networking devices. So components of FreeBSD just find their way everywhere. And the tools are great, and they stand alone uh, well. Uh, and uh, FreeBSD also has a very mature release model, so we'll Historically, we released when it was ready, and that didn't really work very well. Uh, so about 10 years ago, we started releasing software roughly every six months. We say, that, you know, maybe it's time to roll a release, so we go into code freeze and we go into slush, and you know, we we polish, we add spit and polish to our operating system, and then we release it and we move on. So we have a branch development model, which I'll talk about a bit uh, later. And this model is easy for companies to follow. So if you are uh, the Juniper of the world, or you're Netflix of the world, uh, you want your upstream operating system to be easy to follow. If you contrast this with, say, Linux, where every couple of weeks someone throws a kernel over the wall, and you know maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, maybe it boots, maybe it doesn't, uh, and the kernel then goes and conflicts with uh, the uh, other uh, release models of, say, the C library, which has the same release model. You know, maybe it's ready, maybe it isn't, uh, and. Like if you've ever built an embedded Linux system, you know that uh, you can that no no uh, three versions of libc, the Linux kernel, and uh, I don't know the compiler will ever want to work together. Uh, you don't have this problem in FreeBSD because all of us have the same goals. We all work towards the same operating system. We don't fight. Uh, Companies who use FreeBSD also really appreciate our documentation and the fact that it's available in many languages. Uh, so George originally gave this talk in China and pointed out that, hey, the FreeBSD handbook, our, our main uh, corpus of documentation, has been translated into Chinese, and it's a very well-maintained uh, translation. Uh, I took a look at the Indic languages, and unfortunately, uh, the only uh, official language of India which has a good translation of the FreeBSD handbook happens to be English. Uh, so if any of you like translating documentation, you are encouraged to join the FreeBSD project, which you know, I'll talk about that in a moment, and translate the FreeBSD handbook into whichever language uh, you uh, find uh, useful. Uh, the FreeBSD project also has a very business-friendly license, which I don't want to talk about for too long, uh, but if anyone has ever heard the GPL, you know that it is massive and uh, full of uh, scary traps and dragons. Uh, the BSD license is about 300 words, and it basically says, here is some software, uh, use it. Uh, if it catches fire, sorry. Uh, if, it's, if it works well for you, great. Uh, we'd appreciate the notes, but you know, don't feel any pressure. Uh, our community is also something I like to advertise. Uh, I, uh, FreeBSD project has many, many mailing lists, and when you join them, you can usually find a warm welcome. You know, you send a patch, and people will thank you for the patch. And if the patch is wrong, they'll shout about the patch. They are not going to shout at you. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about the community uh, later on. So these are all very compelling reasons to use uh, FreeBSD. So how did we get here? Uh, I, you know, uh, George does this in three. Minutes. I will probably need a bit more. Uh, but the history of Linux is well known. Uh, this, this guy in uh, in Finland had an itch to scratch. Uh, you know, let's let's write an operating system, uh, and that got out of control a little bit. Uh, the BSD history is a little bit more, um, let's say, measured uh, or a little bit uh, more uh, well lengthy at least. Uh, so in the beginning, uh, dinosaurs roamed and chaos reigned. Uh, that was uh, you know 1950s and 60s, and then eventually people realized that you know we need operating systems. No, no sign of BSD yet, uh, but someone uh, came up with Multics, and you know, everything was fine, uh, you know, uh, provably secure, everything okay, time sharing, very good. Uh, and then some people with a strange sense of humor said, well, we've got Multics, we should have Unix as well. Uh, and then, you know, things got out of control a little bit. Uh, still, no sign of, uh, still no sign of Berkeley or BSD, uh, but then after a year or two, People started using this Unix thing uh, from Bell Labs, and they discovered that, hey, this is fun stuff, but wouldn't it be nice if we had nice things? Uh, so some nice people at Berkeley uh, started producing uh, add-ons and patches to the Unix uh, operating system, 
uh, from uh, their labs things that people found useful, like say X and VI, uh, because the Unix editor was Ed, and anyone who's ever used Ed can tell you that it's not fun. Uh, X and VI are a lot more fun. So that was one of the things that was on the Berkeley tools tapes. Uh, another thing on the Berkeley tools tape was a Pascal compiler. Uh, it turns out that not everyone likes writing C. I can't imagine why. Uh, but a Pascal compiler uh, was one of the Berkeley tools. And other tools just came up. Uh, and then in the uh, early 70s, uh, someone had the bright idea that maybe these computers should talk to each other. You know, instead of people being angry at computers, computers can be angry at computers. Uh, so uh, DARPA, the Defense Advanced uh, Research Project Agency, uh, threw some money at the uh, Computer Systems Research Group in Berkeley and said, you know, build the internet. I, I don't think they said that, but that's, you know, I've only got three minutes for this slide. So build the internet. Uh, and out of the uh, CSRG came things like uh, TCP, IP, uh, UDP, uh, ping, uh, and all of these protocols, which we are now, well, we now know and love. Uh, then in the 90s, we had a bit of a hiccup where the people at, U at Bell Labs said, well, you know, this BSD stuff is very interesting, uh, but this is actually our stuff, and we don't want you using it. Uh, so there was a lawsuit um, that just distracted people from BSD for a while, uh, and people started using Linux, but never mind. Uh, eventually, uh, 386 BSD came up, we have BSDI, and then uh, we have finally BSD is free after all this time, and uh, it quickly turned out that BSD was not just one thing. Uh, so we have BSD, historically, a bunch of people at Berkeley, uh, here's a Unix, uh, have fun with it, or here are some add-on tools for Unix, uh, have fun with it. Uh, when BSD was finally free at the, uh, at the early 90s, uh, it turns out that there were two or three different uh, competing views on how this BSD should be free. And we came up with uh, a couple of different BSD projects. We have the NetBSD project, which uh, felt that, uh, well, BSD is very nice, but uh, the best way to use BSD is on everything, from your toaster to your, uh, your mainframe to everything. Uh, the FreeBSD project felt that, well, yeah, that, that's nice. We like portability, uh, but we actually would like to be fast. Uh, so they disagreed with the NetBSD folks on uh, where uh, the platform supports, where you know where the priority should lie. So two different BSD projects formed. We had the NetBSD project going off to be portable, and it's running on every printer in the world these days. And we have the FreeBSD project, which runs everywhere else. Uh, in uh, 1996, the OpenBSD folks had a disagreement with the NetBSD people about you know, priorities on security and portability. So OpenBSD forks off, and uh, a few years later, uh, we also found fewer forks, which uh, forks off in less, uh, you know, in, in uh, less acrimonious circumstances. So PCBSD is basically a fork of FreeBSD. It's now called TrueOS. Uh, which takes the FreeBSD operating system just like Juniper does or just like uh, any of the other consumers that FreeBSD does, and they optimize it for running on a desktop. Uh, Apple does the same thing. They take FreeBSD and they optimize it for running on a desktop, right? Uh, and there's some smaller uh, BSD distributions. But you know, all that aside, I'm not going to talk about them. I'm going to talk about uh, FreeBSD. Uh, back to uh, our, our thread. What do we do? We produce a whole system. What do I mean with a whole system? Uh, I mean that we produce an operating system which comprises all of the device drivers, all of the compilers and associated tools, uh, debugging tools as well. I, I don't know if anyone has ever tried to debug Linux, but it, it, it just, you know, you can't. Uh, certainly not as soon as it's installed. It just, you know, you try and hope. Uh, we have editors in our base system, and we have a packaging system that allows you to install anything that, you know, is not there. Uh, so the point of what we actually produce as a FreeBSD project is an entire operating system that is ready to code when the install is done. Obviously, your definition of code will depend on what layer of the stack you operate on. And our definition of code is you can write programs in C or C++ as soon as your install is done, provided that your editor of choice is either X, PI, or Nano. Uh, and you know that, that's ready to code when the install is done. Uh, we also have a packaging system, so if you prefer another editor like Vim or, you know, like in the life of pain and you use Emacs, you can just package and install these things and have them. But the whole system approach basically means that we, we, what we deliver is known to work at least together with itself. You never have this awkward situation where your compiler is not willing to produce anything that your assembler likes or your linker 
inexplicably does not like the object spat out by your compiler, or your debugger does not understand the particular variant of ELF that comes out of your, uh, of your linker. Those are all things I've encountered on Linux, by the way. Uh, and we produce this as, as a team. We work together on this, and we have one bug tracker for all of these components. And uh, this allows us to uh, you know, deliver a polished operating system that, that just shines uh, very nicely. So if you write a device driver, you, you don't need to go and uh, if you write a network device driver, for instance, you don't need to go and write a tool for that network device driver to, you know, scribble some bits. You can just add it to if config. Whereas in Linux, every single network device driver has some user space tool to twiddle its bits. There's also ETH tool, but there's at least four different variants of ETH. So in FreeBSD, we don't have this because we have this holistic approach. We produce the whole stack and uh, it's not because you're in device driver land that you are somehow forbidden from touching if config. Sometimes I wish that were the case. If config is not my favorite piece of code. Uh, but uh, there's nothing preventing me from going into if config and adding something for my particular device, provided, of course, that you know architectural uh, constraints are met. Um, so what's, you know, I'll talk a bit about what parts of stuff we have in this uh, whole operating system. We have some file systems, uh, which I'd like to talk about, uh, which are real selling points for FreeBSD. We have two file, well, we have a whole bunch of file systems, but only two of them are really relevant. We have the uh, UFS file system, the traditional Unix file system, uh, which is a, essentially the same file system which uh, is on Solaris or HP Unix or any other Unix, uh, because they're basically derived from our original uh, UFS. Uh, UFS is pretty much, it's, it's a rock solid uh, Unix file system, so it, it's, it's predictable, it's not necessarily always fast depending on workloads, but some, some workloads are actually high performance. In FreeBSD, UFS is high performance on read and write under certain workloads. Uh, our UFS also has snapshots, I think Solaris's UFS also has snapshots now, uh, and we have journal soft updates, so if you have a terabyte of data on a UFS volume, it doesn't take three weeks to FSCK. Uh, but if you have a terabyte of data, really what you want is you want ZFS. And uh, ZFS was originally developed by Sun. It was open source. It had a you know interesting history. Uh, but it is the only file system you need if you care. If you have a lot of data and you care about your data, ZFS is really the file system you want. Uh, ZFS is a file system and the volume manager combined. Uh, it has snapshots, which are copy on write, take no time at all. ZFS destroy is instance. You can instantly destroy your data. Uh, also, unlike any other file system I've encountered, uh, ZFS is aware of the fact that your disk is your enemy and it does not trust your disk in the background. It snapshots all your data and it just checks that the disk is not lying to you. Because disks lie, and every other file system just doesn't get this. So it assumes that the disk uh, is telling you the truth, and that data does not get silently corrupted. If you care about your data, you really want ZFS. Uh, I believe there's a ZFS port for Linux as well. Uh, I have never heard anyone uh, using it successfully, or I've never heard anyone who's using it not complain about it. Uh, ZFS also works on uh, Illumos and uh, Sonos or Solaris or whatever they're called this week, of course. But FreeBSD is slowly becoming the reference implementation, well, not the reference implementation, but one of the more mature implementations of ZFS. So if nothing else and you care about your data, ZFS would be one good reason for you to go and install uh, FreeBSD. Uh, you, you, know, you still need backups, but uh, you might not need to restore them quite as often. Uh, FreeBSD also has a lot of security features. Uh, we've had a lot of talks at this conference about containers and uh, container systems and namespaces and all sorts of things. And all of those are just cheap ripoffs of what FreeBSD calls jails. Uh, well, cheap ripoffs done wrong, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so if you want lightweight virtualization and you don't want to ask the question, what should PID1 be in my container? Uh, maybe you should look at jails. Uh, the, so, you know, for the record, PID1 is whatever the first process that you know runs into jail is, and if it catches a sick child, then your zombies will be reaped. Um, so jails are lightweight virtualization. Basically, it's, uh, it, it takes the Sharoot system call from FreeBSD, or from Unix, rather, and it uh, teaches it about networking. So it, it just uh, constrains the power of the root user a bit uh, beyond the, um, the file system. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Sharoot with an IP address, or any number of IP addresses. 
Uh, we also have a Mac and audit framework if you are in an industry that cares about security and cares about knowing what happens in an unforgeable sort of way. Mac and audit are things which uh, should be uh, should be familiar to you or should be you know something you care about. Uh, FreeBSD has uh, distributed auditing, so you can you know you can track every file system event, every network event, get an audit stamp, and that can be sent to another machine, so the log can't be tampered with. Uh, Mac can also constrain other things, so I've, I've just been reviewing a kernel module for uh, real-time priority uh, constraints, so that you, as your process, you can, you can use real-time priorities without having to be root on your system. So Mac can give you more privileges or remove privileges. It's like SE Linux, but done right. Uh, we also have Capsicum in FreeBSD. Yes, you know, I'm honest. Uh, we also have Capsicum in FreeBSD. Capsicum is a research technology uh, from Cambridge, which tries to sandbox individual applications. So you, you, uh, it works on a capability system, and a capability is a privilege you have, which you can either shrink uh, or, or, or delegate, but you can't ever expand it. So once you enter a capability sandbox, you are constrained by that sandbox. Uh, so use cases for this are things like uh, decompressors or things like TCP dump, where uh, if you're running TCP dump and you're dissecting some protocol on the wire, you would prefer not to have this protocol exploit bugs in your shell and suddenly run random code on your system. Uh, Capsicum allows the dissector to run in a sandbox that does not have the privilege to touch files. TCP dump can still write to the terminal, but the dissector can only communicate with uh, the uh, TCP dump itself through uh, a well-known or well-defined and uh, predefined IPC mechanism. Same thing with uh, compressors. If you have this compressed file, which you downloaded from some dubious source, and you start uncompressing it, you don't want a bug in, say, Zlib or a bug in uh, LZMA or whatever compressor flavor of the week you have. You don't want that to suddenly go and blow up your system. So that's some of our security features. Um, we also have uh, good compiler technology. Uh, we moved to LLVM and Clang uh, years ago, uh, so GCC is no longer part of our world. Compilers in FreeBSD are in the 21st century. Not just compilers, but also debuggers. I don't think anyone here cares about the C tool chain, so I'll move on. Uh, Dtrace, I think someone asked this morning a question about how do I know what my process is doing at any given time. Uh, FreeBSD has uh, Dtrace, which is a dynamic tracing framework, which also came from Solaris originally. I think Todd gave a workshop on it uh, here last year. Basically, Dtrace makes the blue smoke visible. It adds a dye to, uh, to all this code going on, and it shows you what goes on inside your process. It tracks system calls, it tracks library calls, function boundaries. You can just you see what your code is doing. Uh, if you're trying to debug on, an op on another operating system, you're basically, you know, you're going to be doing printf, or you're in the debugger saying, stepping. With FreeBSD, you don't have to live this way. We have Dtrace. You know, what on earth is my process doing? Well, you know, Dtrace. Uh, and, oh, yeah, it's doing that. Okay, fine, cool. It shouldn't be doing that. Uh, so Dtrace is another big selling point of FreeBSD. And if you, uh, if you maintain complicated systems, then Dtrace is definitely uh, something to look at. Uh, I believe the JVM has been taught about Dtrace uh, a long time ago. So that might be something to look at. Uh, I ranted earlier that uh, FreeBSD has, or FreeBSD in general, has a networking history. Uh, TCP and IP are Berkeley technologies. Uh, FreeBSD and BSD in general is still the reference implementation of many uh, networking technologies. We uh, have pluggable TCP stacks. If you don't like the default TCP stack, well, use another. Uh, someone has recently contributed to the, uh, the BBR TCP stack. I don't really know what it does. I know Google is very fond of it. Uh, we have Rack. We have the usual cubic and uh, new Reno TCP algorithms. So if you have applications which run on TCP and you care about uh, you know tuning congestion control in different ways, FreeBSD makes this really easy. Uh, I think you can do this on Linux as well, but every time I've looked at the Linux TCP stack, I wanted to cry. Uh, we have uh, three firewalls. You'll find that only two are listed on the slide. Uh, the maintainer of one of these firewalls is right there. Uh, we have IPFW, which is a, uh, a very mature, very good firewall. Uh, it's been around for ages. 
uh, the only thing that's wrong with it is that syntax is not really always as friendly. Uh, and then we have PF, which we uh, we imported from OpenBSD a long time ago. Uh, it's got uh, a much friendlier configuration syntax, so you can actually, you know, I have done a PF workshop, and I've had people type a PF configuration file without looking at a single manual page uh, by just, you know, guessing what the command line syntax would be or just guessing what the uh, configuration file syntax would be. Uh, IPFW is a bit more difficult, and either of those compare that to IP tables. Does anyone know how to add a simple uh, network address translation rule to IP tables without looking it up? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> minus J, masquerade, minus Q, jump through, six hoops, hope for the best. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we've also got something called DummyNet, uh, which is a very useful for people who test things that run on networks. Uh, DummyNet can pretend to be wider or narrower pipes. It can introduce latency uh, on your network. And it can also do queuing, so if you want quality of service, DummyNet can help you too. But it's primarily a network testing tool that, that can introduce uh, arbitrary latency on your network. We have some other networking tools, but I don't have enough time to talk about all of them in depth. Uh, we also have virtualization, uh, you know, things like uh, uh, virtual machines and things, we have that. Uh, many of you use uh, Unreal hardware, you live in uh, the wonderful world of Amazon and DigitalOcean and things, that's great, that's wonderful. Uh, FreeBSD uh, releases are available for VMware, for VirtualBox, for QMU and for Hyper-V. Uh, they will just work on cloud provider of your choice. Uh, since I think 10 point something release, we also have official Amazon AWS images. So if you are an Amazon consumer and you would like FreeBSD, I think it takes you five minutes from create, well, it takes you 20 minutes to create an account, uh, and then it takes you five minutes to uh, boot your first FreeBSD machine, uh, roughly ish. Uh, and those are official FreeBSD images, so you can just do the usual FreeBSD tools, FreeBSD update, etc., to update your system. Uh, we also have Beehive, which is a native virtualization tool. So we, I already mentioned Jails, which is lightweight virtualization. Beehive is the, well, I would say the moral equivalent of uh, KVM, uh, but it's uh, it's a lot lighter weight and a lot more consistent. So Beehive is all the multi-level page tables. So if you want uh, hardware assistance uh, virtualization, you should look at uh, Beehive. Um, I typed this slide earlier. Uh, because I realized that, you know, I need to sell this thing to all these Linux victims. Uh, we also have something called uh, system call translation. Uh, I call that Linux personality disorder. Uh, if you have a Linux binary, which for some reason you cannot compile with package source, whatever Cliff is, uh, to run on FreeBSD, uh, you can just run that Linux binary on FreeBSD, and in the vast majority of cases, asterisk, asterisk, it will work fine, and it might even run faster than on Linux. Uh, so one of the few redeeming features of Linux is that it has a strict contract between the kernel and user space that is usually not violated. Uh, and as long as the operating system presents a system call table that smells a bit like Linux, a Linux binary will just run. So FreeBSD has uh, a system call table that smells enough like Linux to convince uh, Linux elf binaries that, oh yeah, hey, it's Linux, uh, I'll just run. And uh, that allows you to run uh, a lot of binary-only things that are inexplicably only delivered for Linux, such as Oracle's database, uh, or uh, various CAD tools from people like Mentor or Eagle, or uh, it also works well for, you know, you've lost the source code and you only have a Linux binary. Uh, okay, it still works. Um, so system call translation might be something uh, as an easy sort of gateway drug into FreeBSD. And, you know, you might find that your binary runs faster on FreeBSD than it does on Linux. I, last time I saw a statistic was some game, uh, I don't remember which game it was, but it ran faster on FreeBSD than it did on Linux, despite being a Linux binary. Um, some newish features that are in the pipeline, uh, we scale pretty well already. FreeBSD is a massively scalable operating system. Uh, we scale to many cores, but we have this 256 core ARM Thunder machine sitting in a rack and it takes 40 hours to boot. Uh, that's, you know, that's being worked on. So scaling to, multiple, to more and more cores, you know, 200 cores, 500 cores, whatever. Uh, a lot of memory, uh, that's all. So it works up to reasonable limits, uh, but there's always room for improvement and that's, that's being worked on, that's the priority. Uh, NUMA, uh, there is support for NUMA in FreeBSD, so non-uniform memory architectures. There is support for that in FreeBSD. It is ever improving. Uh, we have ARM64 supports. Uh, it, it runs, I've seen it work. Uh, we also uh, support a number of experimental network technologies like multipath, uh, TCP, and data center TCP. Uh, and again, this, uh, this congestion control 
uh, system, uh, TCP algorithm from Google. Uh, should you be running on bare metal as opposed to a virtual machine, uh, FreeBSD also supports uh, secure boots, or known as uh, UEFI, uh, so you can run on you know, constrained firmware uh, without any difficulties. I'm going to speed up a bit. Uh, so that was uh, what the FreeBSD project produces. Uh, you know, we produce this operating system, all this good stuff, and you should all go and use it. Uh, but uh, the FreeBSD Foundation also has uh, the duty to uh, increase the membership of the FreeBSD the project. Uh, so let me tell you a bit about how the project works and entice you into uh, contributing uh, to our, our wonderful project. Uh, the FreeBSD project has a democratically elected core team, the FreeBSD developers, as in the people who have commit access to our subversion tree, uh, elect nine members uh, among ourselves to be our core team. The core team sets the guidance for the FreeBSD project. And this is done every, I forget how many years, I think it was three, but uh, you know, every now and again we elect a new core team. Uh, but so how do you become you know, a member of the FreeBSD project? Well, we have this thing called a commit bit. And a commit bit basically means you can type SVN commit, and your bugs are now everyone's problem. Uh, we have a concept of mentorship, which uh, Google stole from us uh, about 10 years ago and calls it Google Summer of Code, where experienced members of the community will uh, notice uh, people submitting patches to mailing lists and people complaining and backing up their complaints with you know, actual data, and they will mentor these new people into uh, improving their in, improving, improving their code and improving their interaction with the community, and we call this mentorship. Uh, and uh, for you know, we we ask the core team that you know you should this person should become a member of the FreeBSD project. Uh, he should have a, he or she should have a commit bit. Uh, the core team goes and looks at the track record of this developer and says, yeah, yeah, these are good patches, and you know, plays nice with others, and all that sort of good thing. Just have a commit bit, uh, and then your first n commits. Uh, need to be approved by your mentor, uh, after which your mentor says, okay, fine, you're, you go, go off and roam, collect your own bugs, and I'm no longer responsible for anything of that. Uh, the FreeBSD project also has a concept of a hat. Uh, you, uh, you know, if you feel that you need to be a release engineer, you will wear the release engineering hat, and the hat you know, stays on your head as long as you do a good job. If you stop doing a good job, then that will hopefully become apparent to you before it becomes apparent to anyone else, and you, you pass the hat on to someone else. Uh, the FreeBSD project has no dictator, uh, which you know, I, I'll just leave that line out there. Um, so, you know, how do you become a committer? Well, uh, all of you uh, have a task. Uh, you shall join the mailing list. Uh, I would recommend FreeBSD hackers or FreeBSD currents or you know one of those. It's only a couple of hundred messages a day. It, it doesn't hurt much. Uh, you should check out our source code. We use Subversion as our revision control system, but we also use Git and GitHub as a collaboration tool because it's quite, it's quite good for that. So you check out the code and you discover, oh no, it's broken. I don't like it, uh, or you know this needs fixing, and I have too much time on my hands. So you submit a patch uh, to a mailing list, and you keep doing this for a while until somebody notices that you know this person is submitting way too many patches, uh, and that person will then ask you, you know, someone will ask you, would you like to be a committer? Uh, I, you know, just gentleman in the front row here who's undergone this process, he's now crying. Uh, you can say no, uh, but it turns out that people are foolish enough to say yes. Okay, fine, I'll take a commit bit. Uh, so your uh, your mentor then proposes you to the core team or to the ports team to say, you know, I have this new commit. Uh, can he commit, please? And then you, uh, you know, you get a commit bit, and you have to get your uh, commits approved. Uh, and then you know the cycle continues, right? So after a while, uh, you know, this unnamed individual might uh, be noticing someone else on a mailing list submitting many patches, and he can then go off and say, okay, fine, you know, I'm sick of committing his or her patches. Uh, can I please have a commit bit for this person? And then the cycle continues. So the FreeBSD project uh, gets more and more members as time continues. I think that's so Seven more minutes. Yes, um, and you know I'm almost at the end of my talk. I promised not to talk too much about it, but this is the entirety of the BSD license. So if you want to join uh, many of the popular Linux projects, you need to pass a rigorous philosophical examination uh, and have all of your moral background and fiber examined by a team of, uh, I don't know, uh, high overlords uh, on, 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 I don't know, mental purity. Uh, the FreeBSD project uh, does not have such an examination. We subscribe to the BSD license, uh, which I, I have not memorized, but it is short enough to fit on a slide. Uh, so this is the only thing you need to agree to. Uh, well, that and play nice with others. 
others. Uh, but this is the FreeBSD BSD license. It basically says, uh, I wrote this code. Uh, I think it was useful. Uh, if you want it, you know, use it. And I'd appreciate being credited. And I don't care if you submit binaries or source code or if you, you know, print it on a, you know, print it on, on, on poster sized paper and, and display it somewhere. I don't care. Uh, just don't blame me if it blows up in your face. Simple enough license, I think. Uh, this is the GPL. Uh, yeah. Um, it says all sorts of exciting things, but uh, in particular, it is uh, viral. Uh, so the BSD license is not viral at all. Uh, anyone can use it if it's, it's business friendly. You can take a BSD binary. You can use it for whatever purpose you like. As long as you don't blame us for it blowing up in your face, we are cool with that. Uh, the BSD license, 200 words. It's open, unrestricted, non-viral, all sorts of goodness. The GPL, yeah, uh, you know. Uh, so that, that was it. That's all. I have five minutes and 25 seconds to go for questions. We have a website, uh, www.freebsd.org. Uh, as I said, if you have too much money and you find FreeBSD useful, uh, let us know. The FreeBSD Foundation is always happy to help out with uh, monetary problems. Uh, you know, well, the kind where we take your money, not the other kind. Uh, we are on GitHub. If you are a Git user, you can just you know clone uh, FreeBSD from GitHub and start hacking. Join a mailing list to become a committer. Uh, we also have forums if you like websites. Uh, the FreeBSD handbook, as I said, if you like translation, go and translate it into whichever language gives you pleasure. Uh, we hang out on IRC. It's not difficult to find. Type into your favorite search engine, FreeBSD IRC channel, and you'll find a dozen of them. The end. Questions, comments, abuse, violence, tears, stunned silence. Good ones, wait. No? No questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, you are not allowed questions. There are no problems with the bridge. Hello. The code is perfect. Hey, over here. This guy. This guy. This guy. Oh, this right. Guy. Hello. Okay, this guy. Hi. Hey, so you spoke about the file system with the snapshots and the ZFS. Yes. Right? Uh, can you just like quickly brief through exactly what is benefits and what is it about? And like it's basically a different file system altogether. So. Yes. So ZFS is the, the file system to end all file systems. Uh, ZFS is a file system and a volume manager. It was originally written by Sun in, I don't know, late 90s or something. Uh, and basically what it wants to be is it wants to be uh, the, reli the reliable file system for a lot of data. Uh, so uh, ZFS has a volume manager built in, so you have a pool of data which just grows. If you have more disks, you just plug your disks in, and ZFS will happily use the data. Uh, it's got built-in mirroring uh, and built-in striping, uh, so things like RAID. You just add disks, and you tell ZFS, uh, I would like these five disks I just plugged in. I'd like it to be a RAID volume, please, which can survive one toasted disk. Uh, or you tell them that I'd like them to be a mirror, please, so that if I unplug one of the disks or if it fries, that the other disk is exactly consistent. And you can tell the pool that. And the pool is just, it's, it's no maintenance. So you plug in disks and it just works. And it grows automatically. All the storage will be available. And it just works. Uh, on top of that is the ZFS file system, which uses the pool. And the file system has features such as snapshots, uh, which are copy on write. So you say, OK, fine, I'm going to up upgrade my operating system. And I would like to be able to roll back if it blows up in my face, which in FreeBSD never happens. Uh, but then you just do FreeB uh, ZFS snapshots ZFS snapshot, and then the name of your file system and a timestamp, or another identifier that makes sense to you, and you have a snapshot. It takes no time at all. It's constant. It's constant time, and the file system is copy on write, or the snapshot is copy on write rather. So if you're done with that snapshot, you just destroy it, and it was never there. If it turns out that the upgrade inexplicably blew up in your face, which obviously is your own fault, uh, you can just roll back to that snapshot, and uh, that you know the, the the other fork. It has never happened. Uh, you can also send and receive. The ZFS snapshots, so there's streaming support, say you have one machine with a bunch of ZFS file systems, and you've got another machine somewhere that wants this ZFS file system, you can just ZFS send on this machine, and ZFS receive on that machine, and the entire file system just goes across the wire. You know, you just pipe it across SSH, or you pipe it across Netcaf, or whatever you want, uh, and all of the file system properties are kept, such as, you know, compression, ZFS has built-in compression, uh, any snapshots, if you pass it along recursively, just go along the wire. Uh, also, Encoding rules, UTF-8, all that, garbage, I mean, all those interesting features, just travel across uh, with your file system. 
So ZFS is basically, if you've ever used Veritas Volume Manager or another uh, Volume Manager, it, it's that plus a good file system plus, well, minus Anger. So that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Cool. Uh, over there somewhere, I think. One minute and eight seconds before I get shredded. Hi. Hello. Um, it's a tough question, Philip. Oh, no, no. <laughs> uh, I defer to my colleague over here. <laughs> Go ahead. Why is uh, Linux more famous? Uh... Uh, I'm not sure if that's a, well, uh, I'm not sure if there's an answer to that. So part of the answer to that, uh, historically, is that in the, uh, in the mid, mid to late 90s, as the dot-com bubble was beginning to explode, uh, the BSDs were mired in other problems, uh, which are completely irrelevant, uh, both at the time and with the benefit of hindsight. Uh, so I think we just, you know, we, we were off doing other things in the late 90s, and, uh, you know, Linux just took off. I don't know. Uh, also, Linux has a very uh, low barrier to entry uh, in the sense that, you know, you, you can find, uh, you know, you, you, you write some code and you just drop it somewhere and some project will pick it up and it'll end up somewhere because there's no sort of cohesion, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, no shared goal to work towards. So you can find, you know, you fix, fix a bug in ifconfig or you add a bug to ifconfig, you don't have to care about the kernel people. That appeals to uh, a certain hyperactive segment of the population who care more about instant gratification. You know, I want to get that patch out there uh, and are less, uh, I don't know, less less um, tickled by uh, the, uh, the satisfaction of a job well done on an integrated operating system. So I think instant gratification, uh, this whole, you know, there's a dozen people taking my patches and the distractions in the 90s probably led to Linux's success. I don't know. I, I, you know, I used Linux for a while. I'm, I'm, I've been clean for more than a year. Uh, I just don't understand its appeal. I just question, feel uh, it's a fair operating system. Like. Which? Linux or PBSD? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with Linux except for everything. Uh, gentleman in the green shirt in the back, I'm, in, I'm on overtime, so if... if okay. Uh, there, well, this, you'll have to fight. Whoever shouts loudest. Uh, hey. Hello, yes. Yeah. Uh, is there something like edge in ZFS? Is there something like... High availability? High availability, uh, well, it is high availability by default. Yeah. Uh, but you mean things like uh, you have a cluster of things and yeah. one of your machines gets destroyed. Yeah. Uh, not at the ZFS layer directly, uh, so you'd have to do something iSCSI-ish or, you know, you'd have to expose your ZFS through some other means to have this high availability. But ZFS by itself is pretty robust. It, it, it's, you know, obviously if you want high availability for the checkbox, then you'll need to do something like uh, iSCSI or something from there. And I think I'm out of time. Yes. Uh, if I have any special requests regarding tweeting or photograph, uh, I'm not on social media. I'm I'm too social. Uh, no, please. Uh, uh, if if you can constrain yourself to not putting my name on any surveillance networks you might be plugged into, I would appreciate it. Obviously, I have no way to know. So. You know, use your moral judgment. But I would appreciate no pictures of me ending up on the Facebooks of the world, the Twitters of the world, etc. Et Thank you. All oh, right, if you must. Since you asked so nicely. All right, go ahead. So uh, there is one topic: uh, Jelly versus Lux. Uh, jelly. Oh, Lux is the uh, the, the, the yeah. full disk encryption. Yes, uh, FreeBSD has something called Jelly or Gelly, depending on how you pronounce your G's. Uh, it just works. Uh, it's uh, and, and actually one of the nice things about uh, the uh, full disk encryption in FreeBSD is that the gentleman who added support for decrypting disks uh, to the bootloader has actually never written a line of assembler in his life before he committed this feature. Uh, so he just felt that he needed to decrypt his disks in the bootloader so he could have full disk encryption. And he just you know, sat there. And I think this works. It was some of the most horrible code I've ever seen. Uh, but uh, people on the mailing list patiently helped him with, yes, but you know, that's not how Intel really works. Uh, so that's, yes, we have full disk encryption and we have a good, good community. Uh, two questions answered in one go. Yes. And now I'm really out of time. 
Thank you very much. <laughs>